episode, uh, we are going to give out a staff pizza party. So if you got a big clinic, we're going to give out a staff. Uh, we're going to we're going to treat you and your staff to a pizza party. Um, and to win, um, you just got to participate in the chat. You know, so if you want to want uh, win a clinic pizza party, uh, type pizza in the chat. Type pizza in the chat. You know. This, this usually gets the chat going, Paul, you know, when I bribe <laughs> people to like go in the chat, I have to give pizza, you know, a staff pizza. Yeah. Well, food is the, is the ultimate briber. I'll take food any day. Over yeah. Ho hopefully, uh, hopefully we won't end up choosing John Clay's clinic because that would be a lot of pizzas to get, right? Because he has like, uh, what was it, four clinics? That's true. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> hopefully we don't get John's clinic, but if we do, John... <laughs> We are going to get you all the pizzas you need to feed your three, four clinics. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, once again, everyone, I just want to do a shout out. We are not, um, uh, we are not giving you financial legal advice. So you have to talk to your accountant and lawyers. Um, and, uh, and uh, yeah, although, you know, we spend a lot of money on legal fees and accounting fees and, and we, we know what's going on within the community, but I just want to make this important disclaimer so that, um, you know, like, uh, we don't get in trouble, but also like, you know, everyone is in a different situation, right? So, um, hopefully that makes sense. Um, and so just to get, just get the, just to get the ball moving, um, type in the chat, who has known, uh, how many people has known, um, a clinic owner that recently has sold, you know, maybe put like sell in the chat. Do you, uh, have you recently met a clinic owner that has sold, uh, that has sold their clinic or, or thinking of selling type sell in the chat. If that's something that you have noticed, you know, so are you spoke with? Yeah, this is interesting. You know, what's interesting is that, um, at the beginning of COVID, um, you know, cause we have the buy sell marketplace and I, I noticed that there wasn't a lot of sellers. There were a lot of buyers. Um, and that was about two or three years ago. And I totally thought it was going to be the opposite. I thought there was going to be a lot of, a lot of sellers, but two years into COVID now, um, there's a lot more sellers. Uh, there's still a lot of buyers, but there's a lot more sellers now in the market. I think some people are getting a little bit tired, right? So it's pretty interesting. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting. Uh, uh, type in the chat, everyone. Um, the people that you know that are selling or thinking of selling, what would you say is maybe some of the top reasons why um, you think they're selling? Okay. Maybe type that in the chat. Like what has happened like recently um, or maybe in the past couple of years that are can, making some of these people that you know that are selling, that are selling it. So Paul, like um, as people type in the chat, like, what are you seeing with like the clinics that we've kind of like that are talking to you about selling their business, right? Yeah. I mean, there's, it's, it's kind of split up, right? Like some people are just ready for retirement. Um, you know, they're just getting to that age where um, they know they got to pass the torch. Uh, some people like there's a lot of fatigue. And I think a lot of people are actually seeing that. Uh, like we're seeing that in the chat right now, a lot of COVID fatigue. Um, and, you know, it's, it's warranted, right? Like, uh, there's a lot of change in the clinics. So people are getting stressed out by that change, right? Um, and then uh, some people are just, uh, they're just, um, you know, ready to move on to the next uh, thing, whatever that is, right? Um, I know a couple of young guys who, they just want to sell their clinic and move on to a completely different industry. So you definitely get a range, but I'm finding a little bit more of the fatigue stuff uh, going on for sure. Yeah, I, I think more recently in the past, uh, definitely in the two months, hey, Paul, a, a lot of people have been like, oh, man, I, I'm like, I'm done. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> right? Totally. Like this Omicron thing, I think it really pushed people is like, is there like an insight? Like this has been going a long time. And and uh, yeah, I've seen more of that than I've ever seen in the last like two years, right? Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. And, and, and you know what? Like I said, like I thought people were going to panic sell at the beginning, but we're starting to see it come around and, uh, right now. So, and it's not panic. Yeah. It's not just, I think people are just tired. Right. And I think traditionally too, Paul, is that like when we, um, yes, it could be like people are fatigued, but I think there's a lot of like personal stuff going on with people's lives that yeah. are making them sell, you know, and, and it could be, um, maybe like a health condition, right. You know, yeah. it's kind of like, you know, people like us, we're kind of in our forties now. Right. And you're like, you start having, whether it's a midlife crisis, you start contemplating like, Hey, you know, I got like X amount of years left, you know, like, is this how I want to spend life? You know? Right. Oh, definitely. Um, 
definitely. COVID, COVID has made people reevaluate all of their life situations for sure, right? Yeah. I'm also finding it's interesting because there's there's a lot of activity on the buyer side too, right? Yes. Like, like there's a ton of new buyers entering the market. And, um, you know, I talk to my, my people about this all the time. And I think it has a lot to do with the fact that there's... Um, there's a, bit, a lot of bit of, uh, a lot of money printing going on. There's a lot of organizations with a lot of, a lot of cash on their balance sheet, and yeah. um, they need to figure out a way to spend it and make some returns um, yeah. to get beyond inflation and stuff like that, right? So it's, it's pretty yeah. interesting, you know? yeah. Yeah, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, is like what type of buyers are that we're seeing right in the market right now, you know? But another reason that I'm seeing is like people are getting in divorces, right? You know, divorce record, like divorce is like ultimate high right now. I would say, yeah. right? You know, and. Yeah. And when you get into divorce, like, I think we have a lot of people come to us and say, hey, can you evaluate our clinic? How much is our clinic worth, right? And I think a good chunk of those conversations is because, like, they're going through a divorce, right? Or potentially going through a divorce, right? So, right? Yeah, yeah, 100%, 100%. Yeah. There's, yeah. John, Clay's, uh, John Clay's heckling me right now. <laughs> I, am, yeah. I, am a, I am not an economist, so don't quote me on any of this stuff. <laughs> Paul's a macro guy. Right. <laughs> Macro, right, Paul? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and you know what? Uh, you know, obviously, like a couple of the other ones on there is business partner fallout, you know, right? You know, you have a bad business relationship. So, you know, uh, you, you might want to sell your piece or sell the entire thing. Um, you know, and, 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 and I think the last one I have here is, uh, you know, is um, when you lose a superstar biller, right? Mm. Like you lose your superstar clinician, um, whether they move on to a competitor down the street or they set up a new clinic, um, that also makes you reevaluate. Is like, do I want to be in this business? <laughs> right? You know, yeah. I just lost like a good chunk of my business, like you know, a quarter of it, right? So, yeah, that's probably got to be the most demoralizing one for sure, right? And yeah. uh, it does actually happen quite a bit. Um, yeah. And so there's that it's the ultimate choice, right? Do I actually? stick around and, and try to fix my business or do I just sell it right yeah. now and try to cut my losses type thing, right? So. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. So, okay. Um, um, that's cool. So um, let, let's, uh, everyone, can you type in the chat, like um, this session, we're gonna make it a little more like AMA, like ask me and Paul anything, like what is something that you want to um, get out of today's um, webinar, you know, type that in the chat. What is something that you want to um, get out, uh, like learn from today's session? And maybe we'll kind of go deep into it based on what people type in, you know, it could be. And, um, and so people type that in the chat um, and it could be like, you know, like, you know, I think a couple of them is like, you know, like, hey, like how, what's the formula to sell your business or what multiples are being given right now, you know? Um, you know, um, you know, what do you do to boost your valuation, you know, right? Um, and so, uh, or who's buying right now, right? Or, or like if you're in the middle of a deal right now, like what are some potential risk factors that could derail a deal? You know, what is it that you want to get up today's session, right? Um, so Paul, as yeah. people type in the chat, is there one of these things that you want to maybe like start off with? Yeah, why don't we start out with uh, Joanna's question? Like, are there buyers out there for cash flow negative clinics, right? Because that's, um, you know, there's quite a few clinics that, maybe have just started out, um, maybe got hit with like, um, you know, a superstar clinician leaving. And, and so the clinic is now cash flow negative. And so there's, uh, there's definitely, um, you know, there's definitely that sort of scenario going, uh, ha uh, happening in the community. Um, and simple answer is yes, there is. Okay. Now you're not going to get necessarily get like the really great valuations, uh, if it's a cash flow negative clinic. And, it, and there's a couple of factors that sort of matter here. Um, the first factor is like, how much potential does your clinic have, right? If it's a cash flow negative clinic, how much potential does it have? And so uh, when I look at a clinic and it's cash flow negative, the first thing that I look for um, is the number of assessments it gets per week, okay? So let's say, for example, a clinic is losing money. It's doing about $300,000 worth of revenue a year, which I typically find is like the break even point. Um, um, and if cash flow negative, um, what I'll look at is the number of assessments. So if this clinic is getting at least like, you know, five to 15 assessments per week, um, then I think, okay, you know what, this is a clinic that has value, right? If it's only getting, let's say one assessments a week or two assessments a week, 
then I'll probably stay away from it as a buyer because I know that um, as a clinician, as an owner, you're probably stretching out um, or maximizing the value of every single client coming through the door, right? So if it's, if it's getting five to 10, 15 assessments a week, for sure, I'm, I'm going to take a look at that. Uh, the other thing I'll look at is the location um, and what you're doing there as a, as a clinic owner to, to uh, run your business. And if I see that, hey, you know what, I think I can do X, Y, and Z better. Uh, it's a great location, but it's just needs a little bit of work. Uh, then it has potential, right? Um, a clinic that has more potential, uh, more potential is probably like one of those clinics that's doing like, let's say 500 to a million dollars of revenue and it's still cash flow ne negative. Then I'm definitely more interested in that um, because I know that I can make some quick changes to, to get the profitability up, right? Yeah. And one strategy that we just to add on this is that like, you know, if you have a typical clinic, let's just say not typical clinic, but you have a smaller practice, maybe one or two sole practitioners, you know, it's in essence, it's a break even business, you know, you're doing 200 or 300,000 um, dollars, you know, like, and it likely it is negative cash flow, right? Um, that would be actually a strategic, um, what we call a tuck in, where like, you know, like, they might not want your, you might be able to sell just your charts and your phone number to like maybe a clinic nearby. And then like um, this way, they don't have to deal with all the other operating costs, you know? Um, so that's like your rent um, and, uh, and your front desk stuff. So there is value to that. Once again, you know, I think the value in your business depends on the type of buyer you have and, and how bad you want them, how bad they want them, your business, right? So. That's right, that's right. And, and even yeah. though you do have negative cash flow, um, what you, you'll have to maybe adjust your expectations a little bit. Like um, you're probably not going to get like maximum value, but if your goal is just to like get out without having too much debt or too much liability, um, then, then yeah, you're just not going to have to reframe your expectations around this. Yeah. Let's jump into this one. I think this part is important. Um, is that, uh, um, does everyone know what, uh, EBITDA is type, uh, EBITDA, if you know what that is, type in the chat. Right. And so Paul, as people type in the chat, um, can you exp quickly explain what EBITDA is? Yeah. EBITDA is kind of like, um, you know, it's a fancy way of saying net profit with some ad hocs. Okay. So, um, you know, it stands for earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. So basically it's your revenue minus your expenses. Um, and then you would add things back, like any interest payments you have on bank loans, uh, you would add back taxes that you had paid. Uh, and then if, let's say, for example, you, uh, for depreciation and amortization, let's say you, you, um, had a bunch of, um, let's say $200,000 worth of, uh, renovations that you did. Um, you're allowed to uh, add back a portion of that every year. So you, so you could divide that by five and add back like whatever. So this is to high level, Paul. So high level EBITDA right. is like roughly how much uh, how much profit your clinic makes in a month, right? High level, oh, right? Yeah. High Without going into the details because you're going you're gonna to lose <laughs> us, right? Okay. We're, we're not accountants, Paul, okay? Okay, so, okay, okay. okay. So it's that, roughly okay. how... Yeah, so it's roughly how much like profit your business makes um, 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 outside of like extraordinary expenses, okay? High level, right, Paul? That's right. right. That's Keep right. it high. That's right. right. Now, there, there, so, is something, there is something called normalized EBITDA too. I don't know if we're going to talk about that, but if you want me to talk about that or we'll do that later. Yeah, so, so to normalize it, it just means what, Paul? High level, right? Like what it means to run the business if you were like, you know, what does it mean to normalize your EBITDA, right? The normalizing your EBITDA is basically, um, a good example is like, uh, if you pay for your vacations through your clinic, which a lot of people do, right? Just to expense it. You're adding back those expenses because you know um, that um, that's not going to be a real charge and it's going to make your profit look better, right? Yeah. So normalizing your EBITDA is, is really taking out all the extraneous expenses to make sure the EBITDA is accurate, right? Yeah, and another way to look at it is if, 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 a, if a buyer was to buy your business, uh, what would uh, the, the just the EBITDA is what it would cost them to run the business as is, you know, so no fake expenses, you know, um, you know, like if you don't pay yourself, you have to pay yourself, you know, like you need to be able to like factor in like, you know, um, what, what, uh, like is it, it, literally what is it, uh, uh, what, uh, what's your profit uh, um, to run that business, right? So, yeah, right. That's right. Cool. That's yeah, right. yeah. And that, that, that's part important because like when it comes to evaluations, um, it's just a very simple formula. This is the formula, right, Paul? 
Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, EBITDA multiplied by the multiple will give you your price, right? And I'd say 99% of all deals are done this way. In the past, you might have get you might have gotten like a small multiple on your revenue, but but this is how we this is how most things are done. And the typical valuations for an individual clinic owner range from three to five times EBITDA. So if you look at the slide there, um, a, let's say a clinic making $100,000. Um, you know, if you're if it's an individual clinic, you're looking at about a three to five times multiple. So a clinic making hundred thousand at a three times multiple is worth three hundred thousand dollars. Now, when you start looking at the higher multiples, that's typically when you get to clinics that are maybe grouped together, they're part of a larger organization, maybe they're a mega clinic doing like four to five million dollars of revenue a year, making about six to seven hundred thousand of, of EBITDA. Um, you know, or they've been around for like 30 years and they just have a, like a ton of goodwill. Um, but you still need like a ton of good EBITDA to make sure you get those higher valuations. Yeah. yeah. And so maybe, maybe type in the chat, everyone, what is a multiple that you've, that, um, uh, what's a multiple that, that, that you've seen, um, an owner get like maybe in the last year with some that, you know, that's, um, selling their clinic, you know, um, or half sold their business, right? Whether it's to a corporate or, um, um, or to whatever, like, what is a multiple that you've seen, um, um, happen like in your community, you know, right? So we got three times, uh, Adeline, you know, in Quebec is four, four and a half, you know, Sheldon P firms offering seven, right? What else? Like, like what is some of the big corps you guys are seeing? Like maybe like the life marks, the CBIs, you know, maybe like, um, is there, uh, uh, what's, what's some of the other ones that we've seen in the community, like bio equity, you know, all these random people saying they want to get more, like what type of multiples are you guys seeing inside your communities right now? Tip that in the chat. Yeah, we've got three, four, seven. I think there's a big range, right? Like there's a, a much bigger range happening right now. And because of all the private equity firms, like, um, I don't know, like maybe type in the chat too, guys, like, have you received an email from a private equity firm lately? Like type in yes, if you have, right? Um, because there's a ton of new money coming into, um, into the space, which is really interesting. Um, and what they're looking to do is they're typically looking to find buy, uh, sellers who are willing to sell low and build up a business and then sell high later, right? So. Uh, it's happening quite a bit more now, which is which is actually good for our industry. It's like raising up the prices so that we, when we do sell, that we have uh, we can maximize the value. Right? So. Yeah, yeah. But just but but just back to this multiple of thing, um, is that like um, you know like Paul, like maybe you could share some of the multiples that we've seen you know, maybe inside our community or, or like letter of intents or, or deals just more recently. Like it, it really has ranged, you know, and it depends on, it really depends on uh, obviously like the more EBITDA you have and the bigger the group, like the bigger numbers that, that you've kind of seen, right? So, right. hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah. I'm, I'm still seeing the individual clinics going for three to four times EBITDA. Like that's, that's kind of normal. Um, from the private equity groups, I'm seeing as high as five. And from the larger corporations, I'm seeing as high as five. But once you get into the ownership of, let's say, five to 10 clinics, um, we're, seeing, we're starting to see a lot higher numbers. And this is all actual offers on the table. We're not making, like we're not, you know, making this stuff up. Like we're seeing as high as eight to 10 to 11. Like it's, it's, it's getting pretty competitive now. And, um, and uh, it's getting really interesting. Um, so it's really motivating a lot of these like multiple clinic uh, owners to, to really ramp up their game, right? Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, yeah, that, that, that's interesting, you know? So. Who wants, who um, wants an 11 times offer, a 10 times offer? <laughs> 10 in the chat, you know, that's actually it. Just, just so contact. So if your business did 100,000 of EBITDA, it would be, uh, a million worth, right? Is that is that the math, Paul? Is that the rehab math? That that's the math. That is the math. Yeah. So, but yeah, it's uh, I think we got we got some deals happening in the chat right now. Actually, it looks uh, between Matt and Tony. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, uh, that's hilarious, right? So, yeah. um, and uh, and let you know, we were kind of talking a little bit before. Type in the chat, um. 
you know, I think everyone has received an email or a, a phone call from someone that wants to buy their business, you know, so maybe type in the chat, who are you seeing right now um, or that you know of um, um, that is buying clinics right now, you know, type that in the chat, you know, is it um, like, what are you guys, what are you guys seeing? You guys seeing some, maybe some private equity. Yep. Lifemark CBI, like this is the one I do. I think, yeah, Lifemark has, uh, I think CBI has been very aggressive with buying uh, deals in the past year, right? You know, very aggressive, you know, and, and uh, I've seen some very nice RO, uh, LOIs from them as well. And they're double digit uh, LOIs, right? So um, what else is there? Anthony's big corpse, you know, right? Private equity. Yeah. Yeah. Individuals that own a clinic, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, more clinicians for sure. Yeah, there's there's a lot of um, it's it's interesting too. Like there's a lot of young um, people entering the market as well. Uh, a lot of them want to do startups, but um, some of them are coming in to to do acquisitions for let's say uh, they see the potential of let's say non um, profitable locations, um, and they see the potential of that and say, you know what, I I have the ambition and the drive to actually turn it around, right? So. There's definitely a range of new entrants into the market. And I find, uh, you know, not just the younger ones, but people who, let's say, have been working for three to four years, like social media has done uh, quite a bit to inspire them to be more entrepreneurial, right? So we're seeing a lot of uh, those types of people as well. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think even the last, like, uh, I would say even the last, like, six to nine months, because we built such a big community of, like, owners in our community and people that want to sell. Like, I think we've... You know, we've actually spoke with like pretty much everyone on this list, you know, like all the big um, national rehab corps, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, insurance companies, you know, like insurance companies wanted to get into the game. Right. You know, uh, you know, uh, grocery companies that want to go like, come into the space. Right. Um, you know, even like phone companies, you know. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Ha- 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 has anyone uh, has anyone uh, seen. Uh, like, uh, has anyone had, uh, like maybe calls or emails from insurance companies type insurance in the chat. If you, if, if you've actually, uh, um, start seeing some of this stuff in the chat, I'm curious. That would be game changing. Hey, Paul, with insurance companies start owning uh, clinics in, uh, in Canada, what would that look like? Oh yeah. Well, they're already, they're already doing it with, um, the insurance companies are already doing it with the, uh, like the renovation companies. Right. So obviously, like you're going to have like these, uh, you know, natural disasters or hailstorms or whatever, and, and homes are damaged, but they're buying the service companies that re- like help with renovations, with floods and that sort of thing. So I can see the insurance companies start to come into our space, um, so long as the regulations allow it. Right. So it's going to be really interesting next decade, decade for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that is, uh, that's super, super interesting. So Paul, what else in the chat uh, should we kind of answer that's in there, right? Yeah. Actually, you know, let's that. talk about this. Um, since we're talking about selling, what type in the chat, what are the, what are the pros? Uh, let's talk about selling to like some of the big uh, national corporations, you know, right? What are the pros to selling to like a big, uh, like a big national corp, you know? So uh, these are the big like uh, rehab chains, you know, right? Um, whether in Canada or the U.S., what what, a, what is the what is the pros? Type in the chat, you know, All right? Paul, as, as people type that, in the chat, right? Yeah. What are some pros to selling some of the big uh, big corps, right? Well, I think I think the biggest pro is obviously going to be the multiple, right? Um, you know, they have a lot more flexibility, a lot more cash on hand to like. Um, to get the to get the the actual valuation that you want. Um, in terms of um, also like uh, like the negotiation process, they'll and I think John John Clay was saying this like it is a little bit more streamlined, right? Where um, they're gonna know exactly what information they they're gonna need to collect. They're gonna know what financials uh, what financial information that they need, um, and they're gonna actually walk you through the process. Whereas if you're dealing with a little bit uh, like a person who doesn't have as much experience, um, sometimes the negotiations can drag on for quite a bit, right? So, um, yeah, so I think the biggest thing is the multiple. And 
if they're doing things really well, then there might be future, um, like let's say for example, they really like your leadership style. Sometimes they, they make an offer for you to continue on with the leadership group within their company. And there might be um, you know, upward mobility um, scenarios for you as a, as a clinic owner uh, and more of a leader now, right? Yeah, uh, like in our world, we call that aqua hires, right? You know, right? They're actually yeah. acquiring to hire leadership, you know, all right? That's right, that's right. Yeah, so yeah. And then I don't know, like, and the cons, like, it's, uh, it's pretty, it's pretty, uh, I mean, I think everybody feels this is like, what is, it's not necessarily a con, it's more of a question, like, what's going to happen to my clinic as culture once I sell, right? Because as clinic owners, obviously, we care about our people and our staff, and we want to make sure the transition's good. Um, so there's always that piece of it as well. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Type in the chat room. What what is a what is a con or a negative to selling to one of the big corps? Type that in the chat. Let's see if if anyone is brave enough to to type in the chat. You know. <laughs> right. What is that? Chris says my my staff would totally freak out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah so it, it's interesting about the less uh, some people are with less money because you know what here's the thing too because they're negotiating with so many parties right it's cherry pick like you know you're gonna that's why you see the big range right you know if they really want your clinic they're gonna give you like really big multiples but if some other ones you know like may not you know so it really it, it really it really depends right so right yeah it is interesting though because um as the multiples get higher more and more people get convinced you know, like, um, you know, I've seen some people who, who are staunch against corporations, but once they see like that higher multiple on the table, it's like, oh, maybe I'll, maybe I'll entertain that option. Right. So, yeah. 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 yeah like, like Chris, Chris says it well, right. Like the freedom to start a different business, like, you know, um, you know, like some people have other plans once they get a big chunk of cash, right? So it really depends on what your life situation is and what your goals are after a sale, right? Yeah. And, and there's other people who are in the chat, something about like, um, is about like, um, you know, people are concerned about like reputation, right? You know, uh, reputation in the community and reputation to the staff, you know, right? Um, if, if that, um, you know, it, it's kind of been their baby and their brand for the last, like, you know, 10 plus or 20 plus years. Right. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think rules is in here as well. Like, you know, like there's, and, and I, 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 whether it's like the big corps or even some of these more sophisticated, like financial institutions, like, um, the deals are typically not very that straightforward. There's a lot of, uh, what, it, uh, there's a lot of, uh, how, how to say, it, um, like handcuffs, or there is a lot of, um, uh, um um restrictions you know right does it make sense yeah yeah well I, and and again like it really depends on the multiple that you receive right if you're receiving a much higher multiple you should expect a little bit more restrictions on what you can and can't do right uh, a company that's willing to pay like eight times multiple which is a very high multiple they're going to want to know that you're not going to compete with them and open up a clinic down the street Right, so there are going to be restrictions around that, or there may there may be a transition period, right, where they say, "Hey, we want you to transition for one to two years," and a lot of people are okay with that because they're getting an eight times multiple. And the framework that I use is uh, like a lot of, uh, for some reason, we don't make this connection. But um, if you're getting eight times multiple, that means you'd have to spend the next eight years to make that exact same amount of money um, for your if you were to stick around and just run your clinic, right? So what is that? So getting your eight years today, well, there's some benefit to that, right? And so uh, maybe you do uh, want to provide a little bit more comfort to the buyers by providing a little bit of a transition, right? So yeah. Um, so anyways, it's just a different way to think about it. Yeah, 100%. And, and you know, and uh, another thing that I sometimes see is that, and we've been caught in this situation, Paul, is that like, maybe they just, you know, maybe the overall deal, let's just say it's like a million dollars, right? You know, but they only give you maybe, you know, um, $700,000 in cash up front, you know, right. right? And then the remaining 30% or 300,000, you have to like, is based on one year or two year 
um, kind of go, um, goals, right? You know, right? Like performance targets, right? You know, right? Especially when, you know, especially when you get like a really decent multiple, right? Um, I've seen situation, uh, once again, so 70% cash, 30%, like say, um, you got to earn it out, you know, um, you know, and, and it's, um, I think a lot of times, um, most people, a lot of people don't actually hit those targets, you know, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so really, they just end up with seven hundred thousand dollars, right? You know, right? Yeah. Not the full, like you know, like a million, right? So, yeah. Is there anything you want to yeah. kind of talk about that? Because yeah. that happens a lot, you know, right? That that does happen a lot because um, after you sell, of course, there are culture changes in the business, right? So like yeah. maybe some people don't want to continue on with the business, or maybe um, you know you have different plans uh, because because now it's a corporation owning the business. And so the same level of scrutiny that you would have with a business, um, you know, before any uh, be before you sold it, um, isn't there anymore, right? So um, if you are going to sell to a big corp, then definitely keep those things in mind. If you're going to have like a earnout period, definitely keep those things in mind. Um, we just recently sold one of our businesses. Um, um, it wasn't to a big corp; it was uh, to a PE firm, and that was one of the, our biggest. Uh, worries was how are we going to make sure that we meet, meet our earnout? And um, the one thing that we did was we had a junior partner at this clinic, and we made sure that the junior pa partner um, continued to to have his stake in the business once we sold the business, right? And um, it's made the transition really easy, and and the continue the clinic continues to do well, and we're going to meet our targets. So uh, there's definitely strategies you can put in place that will help. Uh, if you do have an earner or no, right? Yeah, or negotiate like something or negotiate more cash, you know, versus more of an earn out, you know, right? You know, maybe yeah. go for the, <laughs> maybe go for the, you know, get try to get 80, 90% cash and then 10, 20% on the earn out, right, Paul? Right? That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Because yeah. typically when someone buys your clinic, you're going to spend at least the first year in transition. If you're going to be honest, you're going to inject new systems, new leadership, new ways of reporting, like meetings. And then, you know, is it realistic that you're going to be able to hit like uh, some of those numbers? Right. Yeah. 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 You, you have to do everything in your power to, to reduce the risk and also um, make sure that there's, there is a good transition. But you also don't want to like sell at a high multiple and, and, um, have the business fall apart after, right? Like that's a reputational issue, right? So, um, so you still have to kind of plan for that for sure. Yeah. Hey, Paul. So let, let's walk us through this. You know, um, you know, like I think a lot of people when they think about like selling a clinic, like they think that oh my gosh, it will take me a few months to sell the clinic, right? You know, right? Yeah. Can you maybe like maybe like high level, Paul, like talk about what is the process of selling a clinic, you know, right? You know, um, you know, like because there's a lot of back and forth going on, you know, and a lot of times like, you know, uh, information collecting. Some of the deals don't even like go forward as well. Right. You know, so can you typically give like a higher level of like, you know, what is the typical process when someone uh, decides to sell a clinic and, 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 and what that looks like and, and, and the high level and, and how long that typically takes, you know, right? Once yeah, they decide sure. on selling, right? Yeah, so um, typically uh, when, I mean, the number one thing is you, you got to get your clinics. Uh, if you want to sell, you have to actually find some like potential suitors, right? And so, um, you know, you could do that through your own network. You can post it on like the association websites. You could do, um, uh, we have a marketplace. So you could, you just want some exposure, right? And then once you get that exposure and you have some people sort of um, coming to the door, Typically, there's, there's that first meeting, and at that first meeting, you're you're trying to assess whether or not this would be an appropriate buyer for you. So um, you may um, ask them a whole bunch of questions around, you know, what's their what's their philosophy around, around running the clinics, how does the transition look like, like all the stuff that we already kind of talked about already. And so once you get sort of a high level comfort, um, uh, just a general comfort level with that person, then you get into sort of the due diligence phase. And the due diligence phase is, uh, it's always best to be prepared for it. So typically what buyers are looking for are the last three years of financials. They're looking for your EMR reports where they can look at provider summaries and um, you know fee schedules and all that sort of stuff. Um, and what they're doing is they're cross-referencing your P&Ls to your EMR reports. They're saying, are they actually doing what they say they're doing, right? 
once they get comfort there, typically what you find is uh, they'll, they'll create an LOI, a letter of intent. And with the letter of intent, it's, it's fairly simple, like one or two pager, like it's not a, a big legal document, but that letter of intent is outlining just the main points of the deal. So what's the purchase price? When do we want to close? And, you know, are there any sort of exclusionary or inclusionary criteria? Um, just, just really basically outlining the big framework of the deal. And, um, and then what we, once both parties sign that LOI, uh, you'll take that LOI to your lawyers and your lawyers will then draft up uh, the share purchase agreement and all the particulars of the agreement and they'll put their legalese in. And the lawyers will still, like the, the, the buyer's lawyers will start to do a due diligence of their own. So they'll do, um, they'll, they'll check for any liens, liabilities, um, any lawsuits against your corporation. And then ultimately at the end of the day, then you close. And then there's gonna be a transition period after that. So typically what I find is like, once you list your clinic, if you get enough exposure, and that's the key part, if you get enough exposure, then, and you find buyers, then you, you it typically takes about three to six months, right? So that's, that's sort of how the, the deal works or the process works. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah. Was that helpful? Type in the chat. Um, in the uh, type in the chat. Helpful if that was helpful. So you get an idea of like like it's actually a lot. It's actually a big process. You know, it it's actually yeah. a lot of work, right? It's a lot of work, and and one of the things that we do in our clinics is we always have this stuff prepared, right? It's just we're um, we've um, you know built our systems, our processes, all of our. Um, you know, any sort of our material where our financial tools, any of any sort of that stuff. So that if a buyer came in, we literally could just print it up and say, here you go. Right. Um, so it's preparation for this kind of stuff is always good because you just never know when a good opportunity might come down, uh, down the road and, and uh, having it ready is just extremely helpful. And then the buyers also, they're, they're actually kind of judging you through this due diligence process as well, right? Are you organized? Do you uh, do you respond timely to the emails? Do you like um, actually um, have all of all of this stuff prepared? And if you do, it's sort of like uh, you know, it, it, it's sort of giving them like a thumbs up approval type thing, just based on your leadership uh, style, right? Hopefully that makes sense, right? Yeah. You know what's interesting, Paul? Something I'm seeing more and more, especially in the last. Uh, in the last year is there's a lot of people um there's a lot of people um there's a lot of buyers right now like they want the information like you know like they're grabbing the information they want to know as much about your clinic as possible and um they may even put that like loi in place you know or, or, but it but it's not it's non-binding here's the kicker right yeah and then they don't complete like you know in essence like it's like six months of information gathering and then they end up telling you saying hey look um you know, option one is like hey look we done some due diligence and like um um and you're not actually earning this like EBITDA right so the price is going to be like chopped in like you know like let's just say 30 percent lower 40 percent lower and then you get disappointed right you know or option two is like hey we did a due diligence here's an LOI you know um and then but we're not ready to buy you yet you know we're still evaluating our other opportunities. And, um, you know, in, that, in other words, we're looking at your competitors right now and deciding whether we should buy your clinic or their clinic. So um, let's keep talking and let's talk again in the next six months, right? You know, or the next year, <laughs> right? Yeah, that's, it's so true. That's a great point. There's a lot of, there's a lot of delay tactics involved because they are trying to, it's like multiple choice for them. Like which one's the best one that we can go with right now? And so they have a lot of coals in the fire right um, at any given time. Um, and so one of the, actually, I'm gonna give away a little bit of a good nugget and it's, it's just really simple, but like, um, you know, once you get an LOI sign, ask for a non-fundable deposit, right? So at the very least your time is paid for and it doesn't even have to, it doesn't have to be a lot. Like I'm not, I'm not saying you have to do a 20% deposit or even a 10% deposit, but you know, a, like, $5,000, a $10,000 deposit, right? Non-refundable so that your time is uh, compensated for when you're actually preparing for all this due diligence, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. If, yeah if you're gonna do, if, if, uh, if you like that tip, type deposit in the chat, everyone. Type deposit in the chat, you know? 
let's put your money in your mouth is, you know, right. And, and, and I would also suggest because this process is so heavy is, is that like, you want to make sure in your first talk that you're roughly in the same like ballpark in terms of evaluation, you know, right. You know, cause if you're not there, like, I don't know if it's worth like that effort of you, like, you know, like giving all this information, exposing your business, like, and, and like all this stuff. Cause it ends up, um, how do I say it? it ends up, it ends up wasting a lot of time. You know, you're probably end up spending 10 hours a week or 15 hours on top of that, you're running a business and still managing your family. Right. So. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. Matthew had a good point. Usually our expectations are, are off between the buyers and the sellers. Right. And so if you can have a very frank discussion right from the get-go, it makes sense. Um, now, I will say that most buyers typically don't want to talk about price right at the get-go because they don't want to say something that they can't, you know, um, you know, they can't, they won't be able to cash that check later down the road. You know what I mean? And so they try to avoid it as much as possible. And the other tactic behind it is that they want to, um, they want to get you sort of, married to the, the idea of selling. So the longer they, they can keep you in the negotiations, um, the more you get married to this idea. So then when, at a later date, when they try to bring the price down, you're like, oh shoot, I'm already this way. So yeah, I'll, I'll take another 50K off the price, right? Like, so, yeah. so just be aware of that stuff. And, and again, like most, like most buyers are actually, they have high integrity. They're not, they're just using these tactics because they need to bring the price down. And that's totally legitimate. These are buyers that uh, they're trying to get the price, best price for the company, right? But on your side, you really, on the, on the seller side, you really just have to be aware of that stuff. And, um, you know, again, this, this sort of brinkmanship, we have to just be aware of it and make sure that we know what to do on, on the other side. Right? Yeah, I love that, Paul. And, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I know most people on that first call won't want to tell you like what their evaluations are. And so the question I've used in the past that worked quite well is, you know, I would ask them, hey, what is like a recent deal that you did lately, like last month, right? You know, um, that was like in this region or, or like this type of like EBITDA, like what, what, like what multiple were you doing? Like, like, what did you give on your last deal of yeah. something very similar, right? And they should be able to explain that without giving too much details. And that kind of puts you in the range, you know, you know? Yeah, hundred percent. The uh, Yeah, I love that question for sure. Um, and, to, and, and definitely people are willing to give that kind of information out, right? So I don't think it's a, it's a far reach. Yeah. Yeah. You just want to be within the range, you know, cause they're not like, um, yeah, it's just a, just a lot of, a uh, lot of effort. Right. Um, right. so, um, all right, let's do the next one. Type in the chat, you know, what do you think needs to happen? Like, you know, for, uh, um, if you're thinking of selling your business like now or the next like three years or five years or 10 years, or maybe next 20 years. What do you think like needs to happen to boost your, uh, um, how much your clinic is worth like today? Type in the chat, what needs to happen um, to boost the valuation of your clinic, you know, right? Type that in the chat. And uh, um, Paul, like yeah. what needs to happen, you know? Oh my gosh, that's a loaded question. There's so many things that you can do to help boost your valuation. Um, and I think the, um, I think the, so you're talking about like what you can do today if you're going to sell three years or five years from now. Yeah. Yeah. Or even the next year or two. Right. Next you year, know, for sure. Yeah. yeah. So it's I just think, any, like for anyone that's thinking of selling either now or later, it's the same formula now. Yeah. hundred percent. hundred percent. Um, yeah, definitely. Well, you got to look at both your revenue and expenses, right? So on the revenue side, can you increase the revenue? Um, by you know working on your systems your process your treatment planning uh your pva there's a whole bunch of things that you can do there a number of new assessments you can do to, to to improve your revenue on the expenses side which i don't think a lot of people do enough of is like really keep, uh, making sure you keep track of everything that you're spending and seeing if you can like tighten things up a little bit and you'd be surprised at how much waste there is uh in a clinic when it comes to uh, your expenses. Now, another big thing too, uh, regarding expenses is like your HR costs. Um, and that's, that's a real big thing, right? But when you look at like, like boosting your, your entire valuation, right. Um, from a, like you actually have a buyer on the table, you definitely want to get your multiple offers. Okay. 
So when you get multiple offers and people know about the fact that you have multiple offers on the table, they're more, and, and they actually like your clinic, then you're, you're likely going to get um, higher valuations, right? Um, the other thing to kind of touch on it is like, if you um, implement your systems and processes where you are not, the, the clinic is not dependent on you, right? That, and that's a huge one. If, if you have your systems process and your org structure set up so that you literally can run your clinic from Hawaii like three months out of the year, that's very attractive to buyers because they know that it's a turnkey operation, right? Um, and uh, again, with the management team, if, they're, if you train your management team really well and you incentivize them and you can show them the bigger picture and potentially even negotiate with the buyers that, hey, you, you should really keep X, Y, and Z people on your team uh, can you, can you continue forward. Uh, that's a very, very attractive thing to them, okay? Um, having a pitch deck really helps as well, right? So in terms of um, selling, I think a lot of us go into a selling scenario and we just try to kind of wing it, right? And I find uh, most of us aren't great at winging things, so we need a little bit of structure to be able to really uh, show the value of the business. And we do something called value stacking. So um, these, it's basically, what are the 10 things that make this clinic so great? When you value stack, it really puts in the, the, the buyer's mind that, hey, this is a clinic that I really wanna buy because uh, essentially you're just highlighting all the great, the positive things about your business. Right. It's kind of like no different. Like when you go into, um, when you go look, uh, when you go to, uh, you know, you, you go look, uh, uh, what is that? Uh, you get a, you go to open house, right. Of a really nice property. Right. They give you like a nice little package like for you to leave and, and it sells the house for you. Right. So you yeah. need a package that sells your business for you. Right. So that when you give it to like one buyer, two buyer, three buyer, five buyer, like, you know, and you get these multiple offers that, that ends up like, you know, like helping you market and sell your business, right? You know, so. 100%, 100%. And then the last thing is uh, give yourself time. And this is a pretty obvious one, but, um, you know, it takes time to put in all of the uh, five points above, right? It takes time to set up your teams, get your management team in order to create your pitch deck, to make sure your finances is in order, all of that sort of stuff. Like literally, uh, if, if I could give you a timeline, it's like literally one to two years. That's what I would... That's what I would say is a good time to prepare for, for your business itself. Right. Yeah. Cause everyone's in a different tax situation too. So when you talk to your accountant, um, you might have some assets within your business that you got to move out, you know, right. Or maybe like, um, based on your income coming in, like it doesn't make sense for you to sell this year, you know, or you're not eligible for the capital gains because of A, B, C, D, E, F, G, you know, whatever it is. Right. So like, you know, so you need to be able to like plan yourself doing that. So, right. Yeah. But ultimately at the end of the day, all these things that we're talking about is that like, you know, you need to be able to increase your EBITDA, right. You know? Um, and, 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 um, and you need to make it so that this EBITDA continues after you sell, right? And, and if you could prove that, and that's through systems, leadership team, all this other stuff, it makes it very attractive for the buyer to buy, you know, right? So, yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, I, 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 just a short story, like the, when, when you have a, uh, I've seen a scenario where a clinic has been doing extremely well, uh, but 50% of the revenue is coming in from the clinic owner. Uh, and even though this clinic is making a shit ton of EBITDA and tons of revenue, the buyers don't want to buy it because they know once the, the, the seller leaves or the owner leaves, the clinic's done, right? So the more hands-off you can make your clinic, the better, for sure. All right. Okay. Everyone type in the chat. What was your biggest takeaway? Uh, type in chat. What was your biggest takeaway from our session today? You know, because there's so much gems that Paul kind of shared on today's like session. What is your biggest takeaway from today's session? I'm super, super curious, you know, right? Type that in the chat, you know. Well, what was yours, Paul? As, as, uh, what, did you have any like aha moments, you know, by, uh, well, I mean, I, th I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of people on this call and, uh, for me, I'm always surprised that like, um, how the industry is changing, uh, when it, because of COVID, right. 
there's a lot of opportunity for uh, clinic owners right now um, where that opportunity really wasn't there like pre-COVID. Um, I'm finding the multiples are going up. Um, um, and so that's, that's really good for our industry. But what I'm finding is that the buyers are still very choosy and picky about who they're going to bring on. Um, and so if you can do the things that we talked about on that last slide, um, then you have a much higher chance of, of uh, actually doing well with a sale uh, if, that's, if that's your choice. Okay, cool, cool, Paul. And uh, maybe um, um, that was awesome, you know, and, and Paul, when you look in the chat, any other like stuff that you want to pick out here from people on the takeaways? Um, yeah, I think the range actually, range multiples is a good one, right? Um, yeah. You know, uh, I, think, I think the gem that I, the simple one that I talked about, the deposit, I think that's, a, that's actually a really good one. Um, which I, I don't know why I never used to do that, but we, we just started recently doing that. And it's, uh, it's really helped sort of uh, take away the noise of buyers who are just sort of kicking the tires, right? So, um, so that's one, one really simple thing that we could do as well. Yeah, okay, cool. So um, that's awesome. Um, we're um, we're gonna give out the pizza party parlay like, in the next couple of minutes, um, but until we spin the wheel, um, I actually want, um, I actually want to talk about, um, Paul is running, um, a, a, a challenge on how to prepare a clinic for sale, you know, and, and, uh, Paul, maybe, um, and, and I think this is a perfect program for anyone who's thinking of selling, whether now this year or the next like couple of years. Okay. Uh, in the next, if you're thinking of selling your business now or the next couple of years, Paul, can you explain to, uh, can you explain to me about what is like your 30 day challenge look like, you know, right? Yeah, this, um, this is sort of the culmination of all of uh, our experiences, all of, uh, all of, you know, the last 15, 20 years of buying, selling and doing deals um, and, and really how to prepare yourself for a sale so that you can maximize uh, the valuation of your business. Um, so you can see on the slide there, we've got four weeks of, of, of challenges um, and essentially uh, four weeks of, of the challenge. And essentially what I want to do in week one is, uh, Get you guys to understand like how are we going to prepare your operations uh, for sales so things like looking at your management structure your org structure maybe even your junior partner uh, structure so that um, when you do sell people uh, the buyers will look at this as a turnkey operation and say you know what this is this is definitely um, one of the priorities of, of a business that i would like that we would like to buy um, the next thing that we would do uh, in week two is prepare your financial statements. And so we're not uh, getting you to actually fix your financial statements in that one week, but we're going to give you the, um, basically the roadmap of how you can work with your accountant to make sure that your financials are cleaned up. And it's not just looking at your profit loss statements, but also looking at your balance sheet to make sure, um, you know, there's as little questions as possible from the, from the buyer side uh, so that it could be a quick and easy deal. Week number three, we're going to create a pitch deck and I'm going to give you guys a template so that you can have a pitch deck for your potential buyers. And, um, you know, creating pitch deck is a real pain in the ass. So this uh, pitch deck, I think, is really um, going to be helpful for people to just literally swap out the pictures, put in your clinic name, um, ultimately use this deck so that you can actually uh, use this to, to, to court uh, potential buyers. And then week four is uh, really understanding how to find the right buyer. Um, like we were saying on the call today, there's going to be a slew of different buyers. And depending on your situation, you're going to want to look for a certain demographic, right? So if you're a smaller clinic, maybe it's a, um, and you're not, not making a lot of profit, uh, you know, maybe it's a younger uh, a potential buyer. Um, if you're a larger location, um, we're going to uh, figure out how to get you the, you know, the, the big buyers that will get you the multiples that you want. Um, and so, yeah, so basically this four week process, this four week 30 day challenge will help you get prepared. Um, and whether you do it now or five years from now, um, I think it'll be super helpful. And what's a, what's a start date, Paul? Is it March the 1st? Is that when March it starts? 1st. Yeah. March 1st is the start date. Yeah. Okay, cool. Cool. Yeah. And so, um, so everyone, um, uh, if you want to sign for Paul's 30 day challenge, uh, I put that uh, in the zoom link. I'll also send an email as well. 
Um, but just very high level guys, like this, this 30 day challenge where Paul helps you to be able to prepare your clinic for sale is for $994. Um, and, uh, and, uh, in, in, in essence, it's a 30 day challenge, but Paul will, you have access to Paul for the next 60 days to put all the stuff together. Um, and also it's a good chance for you to be able to experience cl the clinic accelerator community. If you want to continue doing that, you can stick around afterwards for $497 a month. If not, it's $994. Um, and what it looks like when you check out everyone, it, it looks something like this. Uh, and, um, and just know that you'll be billed like for two months, you know, for doing this. And, and once you sign up everyone, um, 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 Fiona, uh, is it Fiona or, or Joy, Paul, like that will set up a call with, uh, with them. Right. It'll be Fiona. Yeah, it'll be okay. Fiona. So yeah. Fiona's up a call with you and I'll show you exactly how it works, you know. Um, plus, you get full access to Clinic Accelerator and, and all the tools that's available. The challenge does start on March the 1st. Um, and then uh, in a nutshell, like I think this one, uh, this one, this two months with Paul will help guide you on how to get your clinic for sale. Um, and uh, once again, I think whether you're thinking about now or you're thinking of selling in the next like year, two years, three years, I think this is like something you should really evaluate now because um, it's the right investment. Um, and I think, uh, I think uh, Chris had a question. Is this self-paced or is this group-based, Paul? Well, it is a, it's going to be a group-based challenge, but you are going to have homework uh, for you that you're going to do for yourself for your own clinic right yeah whether you do Absolutely. the homework or not is completely up to you but i would i would suggest that that you try uh, because yeah. it's actually a really great exercise not just in um uh like understanding what your clinic is worth and and what the potential sale could look like but it's a really great exercise to uh to see what the potential of your business is from an operation standpoint as well so yeah um, okay. So yeah, definitely. It's a, uh, it's a little bit of both. Okay, cool. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So we'll leave with that. And uh, we are, uh, we're going to wrap up now. And so we are going to um, um, spin the wheel to win for the pizza party, you know, type pizza in the chat. If you want to win, um, you want to be eligible for the pizza party, right? Type pizza in the chat. If you want to win a clinic pizza party. This is for all your staff, all of your staff. <laughs> All your staff. Oh, geez. Is it going to be a big clinic or a small clinic, Paul? I don't know. We'll see. We will see. Awesome. Okay. Uh, just give me a sec. I, oh, uh, well, you know what? We got to do the, uh, I got to get this set up. Number picker. Here we go. All right. You got to show your screen. Oh. One. I will. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do a lot of people type pizza, Paul? Oh, lots of people. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we're going to do this, everyone. Type a number out of a hundred in the chat, you know, and if your number is the closest, uh, we are going to give you the pizza. Okay. And this is based on honor systems. <laughs> we're not going to remember what you wrote. So whoever is the closest has to be honest and we're going to spin this wheel. Okay. I think, I think everybody will keep us honest. <laughs> he will. And if, so what happens if we have a, a tie, then we'll spin again, right? Is that how it works, right? Or do we give out two, Paul? Oh, if you're feeling generous, maybe we should give out two. <laughs> oh, geez. All right. Okay, we're going to spin. Uh, let's see, let's see. All right, uh, in count of three, we are going to um, have any last minute entries. John Clay was the last one, I believe. Okay, we're going to spin to win. Let's go. There's, there's a lot around 37 to the Oh, this is a long spin. Eighty-nine. Who's the closest one to eighty-nine? Right. I think it was uh, seventy-four. Right. Who's Who that? that? Roberta. Was it Roberta? I think it's Roberta. Yeah. Yeah, it's Roberta. Oh, <laughs> last call. Is there anyone else? Is it Roberta? I think it is. Right. Roberta. Yeah. Hey Roberta, can you uh, can you send me an email, or maybe you could Slack me, and uh, and uh, and what, what we'll do is uh, we'll get the team to uh, get you uh, get you that pizza party, right? So congrats, right? Congrats. Okay, cool. And then uh, maybe we'll stick around for the next like ten minutes. Uh, Q uh, Q and A. Does anyone have any questions on what we talked about today? Um, maybe we could do a bit of that, right? So. And for the people that have to leave, thank you for uh, joining this episode with Paul. Uh, let's give a shout out to Paul. You know, Paul doesn't normally like to be on screen to people he doesn't know, and he's done a really good job today. I know it's really pushing his uh, comfort zone. Maybe type Paul in the chat. <laughs> I'm not, I do not like public speaking. It's period. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, totally. Well, you're okay with in our community, but outside, I could I could sense that you know you're like I don't know these people. I don't know all the people in here. <laughs> it's not that I don't want to meet you and, and be friends with you. It's just a it's a personal public speaking thing. So <laughs> yeah, you're doing good, Paul. Um, let's see. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions? Type in the chat, and we could put your um, yeah. We could uh, we could answer your question on mic today. So let's kick it. Yeah, Katie has one. So. Oops, Joanna. Hold on, let's go with Joanna first. So if we're selling now, are the financials before COVID more important than during? Uh, yeah, so that's a great question. So the question is, when people, um, when buyers come in, are they looking at pre-COVID numbers, post-COVID numbers, um, or COVID numbers, we're obviously not past COVID. But typically what buyers will do is they'll look at the last three years but what's more important is the trailing 12 months. What does your business look like in the last 12 months of business? Cause it's the most recent. And really what they want to see is the reason why they want the last three years is they want to see some consistency. Um, but the last 12 months will tell them, you know, has there been any, uh, you know, major issues in the business? Is it a downtrend? Is it an uptrend, et cetera, et cetera. So, it's a little bit of both. It's like last 12 months is the most important, but last three years is also very important for consistency. It depends how good your pitch deck is and how you sell it, right? You know, because you might have three years of really like mediocre, like financial statements, but the last trailing 12 months is like, you're just booming and you're like, just on start this hockey stick. You can negotiate more favorable terms, you know, right? Yeah. And, and actually, you know what, that, that brings up a good point there, Rick. If you have a pitch deck, like, you know what's going to happen is let's say you're talking to one person but they're going to take that pitch deck that information back to their team and a lot of times if they don't have any material they're not going to translate um what they found well to their team right so a pitch deck actually helps with that right yeah that's cool. good all right uh katie's asking what are the chain uh changes of selling assets versus shares okay so uh, there's two types of purchases, an asset purchase or a share purchase. Uh, an asset purchase is where you're just selling the assets of the business, like your equipment, um, what you spent on renovation costs, et cetera, et cetera. Share sales is where you're selling the shares of your corporation. Now, there really isn't that much of a difference to the buyer. This is more important to the seller. So if you're selling your clinic and you want to, you know, take advantage of, let's say, a capital gains exemption, um, then you want to sell the shares of your business because then you can uh, pay less tax on the business that you just sold. With an asset purchase, you're just literally selling equipment. So you're going to get taxed at the highest rate, right? Um, the only other thing that maybe from a buyer perspective, why they may not want to buy shares is that if you have a lawsuit or a liability on your business, um, where, you know, let's say, for example, you have a loan that you haven't paid for like, you know, 10 years and or there's a lien or something, or there's a lawsuit on your business, um, they may not want to buy the shares. They just want to buy the assets because they don't want that kind of liability. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I think for most, for most sellers, you, you know, most sellers typically want to sell share purchase. So they're eligible for capital gains and paying less taxes, right? You know, so that's right. That's right. Yeah. Uh, the buyer yeah. typically just wants to buy the assets, right? You know, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a little bit more complicated to do a share sale, but buyers will typically just, um, if they really want the clinic, they, they'll just go with whatever you want, right? Yeah. Cool. All right, John Clay is asking, will depend on current staffing as well too? I'm not sure what that means. Maybe you can elaborate, John. Um, yeah, like Chris is asking, is growth taken into account at all? Absolutely. I think Rick already mentioned that. If you're showing- That's why the trailing 12 months is really good, you know, right? You know? Right. Yeah. Right. If you're showing trending growth, that's that's actually a really positive thing for sure. Yeah. Rupert is asking, when will the challenge be posted for sign up? Will there be a cap on participants? Uh, there won't be a cap on participants. Uh, I don't know, Rick. When's the posting going to go up? Uh, no, I, I think it's going to go on next uh, this week, right? So yeah, this week or next week. Yeah. So just uh, pay attention to that, uh, Rupert, and Slack, and you'll see it, right? So yeah. Okay. Cool. Katie's asking, what is the benefit of hiring a third-party evaluator? So um a third party evaluator is good if you if if you have um let's say you have 
uh, multiple people at the table, or let's say, for example, you're selling to a junior partner who's not got a lot of experience and they're maybe a little bit skeptical about the price that you're giving. Um, that's where a third party evaluator comes into play. Where I wouldn't do a third party evaluator is if it's a small clinic. So if you're doing less than, let's say, $300,000 of revenue a year, I probably wouldn't do a third party evaluator because it's expensive. Third party evaluators typically cost uh, five to ten thousand dollars to do it well. Um, having said that, we have a we have a uh, a guy who does it in our community and gives us a massive discount. He does it for twenty five hundred dollars. So, if you guys are interested in that, you can email Rick and he can pass you on to me and I'll I'll introduce you. But again, it really depends on your situation and the size of your clinic. I think we've seen a lot of people, like you said, uh, use a evaluator for. Um... Um, between like business partners, right? You know, or, or, or through divorces, right? You know, yeah. right? They want to yes. get, get an evaluation on, uh, on uh, uh, how to split up the assets, right? So, right, or set up, right. split up the shares, right? So, yeah. Edson yeah. is asking any ideas about tax implications when you sell? So, um, the biggest tax implication is, uh, I think I talked about already, is the share sale. Um, if you haven't, there's something called capital gains exemption. So you have, I think, up to $850,000. If you sell a business, uh, up to $850,000 where you don't have to pay tax on it at all. Okay. So let's say you sell your clinic for a million dollars. 850 of that, you don't pay any tax. The remaining $150,000 is where you pay the tax. And that's a capital gains tax. So it's actually 25% of 150,000 is how much you would pay in tax. Okay. But don't take our word for it. Definitely talk to your accountant. Every situation is a little bit different. You may have used your capital gains exemption. And so you might not have room left on it uh, to, to take advantage of, but definitely talk to your account, accountant about it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Chris is asking, will tax saving strategies be covered in the course? Yeah, if, you, if there's enough uh, you know, demand for that, yeah, definitely we can talk about that for sure. I think we're going to talk high level, but once again, I think the details, everyone's in a very different situation, you know, right? Yeah. And so, um, you, um, you know, depending on, yeah, what's kind of bundled within your corporation, you know, right? And what's in there. But that's where the content fits in. Most of them are, yeah, they, they kind of tell you how it is, right? So you just yeah. don't know what to ask them. Cool. That's okay. it, right? That's it, right? Okay. Well, everyone, have yourself uh, an amazing Thursday, and uh, we'll, we'll see you guys in the next episode or next webinar we ran. Okay, so see you, everybody. Bye, guys.